I was pitching to five very successful um, investors, but only one was a female. Um, Barbara was the only woman. And the men, as, as much as they thought it was a sweet product and a great, you know, heartfelt story, because they were very kind to me, they didn't get it. These were guys who were not home giving medication to their kids, if we're honest. I mean, they either had nannies or their wives were doing it. So they didn't get it on the sense of like, oh man, been there, done that. Barbara did get it. And so, yes, they went down the row one by one and said, you know, for these reasons, I'm out. Uh, and then Barbara said, I'm going to take a chance on you. And it was funny because she saw me then and she said the most profound thing. She said, I see myself in you. Y'all, this is such a super cool episode. I'm talking with Tiffany Crewmans. You may know Tiffany from Shark Tank. She was actually on the very first season and she has a really memorable episode. And I think it's because um, she went on without any sales, but the sharks were like, this is cool. We're going to invest in you instead of the product type of situation. And 11 years later, it's super successful. So Tiffany is going to talk about her experience with Shark Tank and how she is helping people now. And she's kind of being a shark herself. If you have a product or a product idea, Tiffany is the one to go to. She actually has a super inexpensive online training that she is offering Media Maven listeners. If you use the coupon code MEDIA at tiffanycrewmans.com, that's where you can find her online course, online training program um, for product development. You're going to get an insane deal. And this is like a prerequisite. This is like your consultation call. You'll hear her talk about it. If you want to work with her, in the capacity like somebody would work with a shark on Shark Tank, then you want to go to her website. Her name is Tiffany Crewmans. I'm linking to this in the show notes. You just want to make sure you use that coupon code MEDIA to get a discount and get access to her program. I learned a lot in this episode because I know nothing about creating a product and selling a product. And I learned a lot. It's super duper interesting. And she's also giving us an inside look at the Shark Tank process. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Tiffany. Ever wonder how some people seem to get a ton of media coverage and you don't? Welcome to Become a Media Maven, where TV reporter, host, and news contributor Christina Nicholson shares years of media experience to help you get the media attention you and your business deserve. And now, to help you master your media coverage, Christina Nicholson. Tiffany, thank you so much for joining me on the Become a Media Maven podcast. It is a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It is so nice to chat with you because, A, we all love Shark Tank, and you are a Shark Tank success story. But there's a lot of Shark Tank success stories. Yours is more memorable, I feel, than a lot of the other ones that we've seen over the past 10, 11 years. Do you have any idea why that is? I think it's because I had a brand new idea. You don't see that as often now. Now they look for products that they can show some progression on, you know, a few months later for a follow-up or the very next season. And that's just not realistic in the product development space. So I think mine was memorable because people saw somebody go on with just literally homemade prototypes and say, please, you know, help me out. And now all of a sudden they think overnight that it was this huge success. So... And just to remind everybody listening, you had Ava the Elephant, and she was <laughs> – I'm talking about Ava like she's a, she's a person or she's an I elephant. Do. <laughs> okay. Um, and I can relate. I think any parent who has ever tried to give medicine to their child can relate. They don't want to take it. But, no. but this medicine, I guess, dropper – was in the shape of an elephant and it would distract the child from actually being medicine and it would just make the process a little bit more enjoyable, correct? Yes, that was the goal was to take away this fear because I acknowledged that this little boy I was working with at the time would see this medicine dropper and would freak out at the sight of it. I mean, it was Tylenol, it was simple little things he was trying, having to take that, that even tasted good at that point, tasted like cherry or whatever. And it was just the process that terrified him and most kids. So my thought was, why doesn't it look like something child-friendly? Why isn't it shaped like an elephant? Why doesn't it have a voice or an animal of some kind? Um, so yeah, then it became Ava the Elephant. I love that. Okay, question, because it's been a while since I've seen your episode. And <laughs> the show has changed tremendously since then. Yeah. If I remember correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, 
the sharks weren't too big on investing at first because you did come in with an idea. You, I, If I remember, you didn't have any sales. You just were very passionate about this idea. And they almost said no, but then they invested in you because of the way you were delivering the need yes. for this product, right? Yes. So what happened was we're, I was pitching to five very successful um, investors, but only one was a female. Um, Barbara was the only woman. And the men, as, as much as they thought it was a sweet product and a great, you know, heartfelt story, because they were very kind to me, they didn't get it. These were guys who were not home giving medication to their kids, if we're honest. I mean, they either had nannies or their wives were doing it. So they didn't get it on the sense of like, oh man, been there, done that. Barbara did get it. And so, yes, they went down the row one by one and said, you know, for these reasons, I'm out. Uh, and then Barbara said, I'm going to take a chance on you. And it was funny because she saw me then and she said the most profound thing. She said, I see myself in you. And she didn't even know then that like we both struggled in school and all of the similarities that we would then learn that we had um, that, you know, over the next seven years that we were working together, it's, it, it was insane that we had that instant connection. And it was such a blessing. And she's a, she seems like a nice person. She's incredible. She is incredible. She's harsh. She's a businesswoman. Don't, don't get me wrong. She's a very firm, um, very brilliant businesswoman, but she became a good friend of mine. So tell me what Ava the Elephant looks like now, 11 years later. So Ava was um, one design for a seven-year period, we, the one that we got ready for Shark Tank very quickly. So it wasn't, it wasn't what I wanted it to be necessarily because we had to rush to get ready for the show to air. And I only had like eight months to do that, which is nothing for the type of product it's, that this is and a medical um, product. And so we rushed a bit. We got on the other side. Parents, children loved it. But I always looked at it as a creator as like, oof, you know, I really wish this was different or that was different. And so about seven years into the journey, Ava was still doing really well, but we were at a turning point of, okay, we can't continue to be a single SKU forever. We have to do something. We either have to build a bigger brand around this product, or we have to license it to a bigger brand. And so we chose the path of licensing, and we we did a partnership with a company called Baby Delight, where we licensed Ava to her to them. And that was a three-year licensing deal that literally is just ending last month. And it was incredible. It, it basically allowed me to, to step back from what I hated so much about business, which was just the craziness of running a day-to-day -day business. It's a lot of work, even with a single SKU product. And that's not my sweet spot. I'm a creator. I like to design things. I like to dream. And so running the day-to-day -day of it was not where I was happy necessarily. And more importantly, I didn't get any time with like children anymore. You know, children was my happy place before I did this. They're the reason I created it. So when I licensed it, I was able to go back and visit hospitals and just spend more time doing all the things that I love and creating new products. And then that led me to Mom Genius, which I'm sure we'll get to later in the show. We will talk talk about Mom Genius. First, I want to talk about licensing because mm -hmm. you you offer a lot of helpful information, things you have learned and executed over the last few years um, on your Instagram page, on your LinkedIn page. So quickly explain what it means. Like you said, you licensed to Baby of Delight. That gave you the opportunity to step back, focus on other things. So what does that mean when you license something? How, Absolutely. how does I'll, I'll your world down. change? And then how does, um, how does it work financially for you and for mm -hmm. them? So licensing, excuse me, licensing basically means you still own your IP. So I have a trademark and a patent on Ava and I still own that. I still hold the rights to that. And I'm basically letting a company borrow it for a certain amount of time. I'm saying you can take over the running of this business, both the manufacturing, the funding, the distribution, all of it, all the heavy lifting. If that's how you organize your licensing deal, they can be set up differently, but that's typically how it works. You can take this over for a certain period of time. So mine was three years. And you basically step back and you get a percentage, what everybody knows as royalty. So you get a certain percentage of every single sale that is made. And what was ironic to me about it was I was still, even seven years in, making so many mistakes and still struggling so much with the, org you know, the organization and the, the logistics of this company that... I ended up making more personally after I licensed, even though I made a percentage, you know, like say, let's just say it was 12% of each one. I made more directly because I was working with a bigger company who had the know-how to do things efficiently. So they were shipping at the right rates. They, and they, they just organically get 
things at a better price. So a bigger company obviously gets better shipping rates, better better uh, terms with a factory, for example. So even though what people considered me big because of Shark Tank and Barbara, this company I licensed to had already manufactured, you know, 15 products with this factory they were working with. So they had very good terms and relationships with this factory. And that is, uh, that can be a game changer. And so it, it put me in a position to basically step back. I was still the face of the company. I was still, I was making basically mailbox money every three months. And um, I got to still tell the story of the brand and how it came to be, but they did all of the heavy lifting. That's amazing. So you were making more money and working yeah. less. I mean, it was like, it was very close to the same amount of numbers, you know what I mean? Because it, yeah, when I looked at profit, it was, it was, and it was a bigger company. So the reach was better. The um, channels of distribution were already better, even compared to me and Barbara, because again, once those companies are, here's a great example. Okay. I licensed to Baby Delight. Months later, I got um, an email that Ava was going into Bye Bye Baby. I did not have Ava in Bye Bye Baby prior to that because um, because we were a single SKU product. And the way that retailers work is if, if a buyer is buying product for that store, it, they have a lot on their plate, right? So their job is to be the buyer, to talk to all these different companies and purchase product. If they can purchase 15 SKUs from Gerber, they're going to do that. If they can purchase 15 SKUs, which they did from Baby Delight, and I'm one of them, that's super easy for them. Add another SKU. This is a company I work with an invoice. If you're a single product and you're trying to sell to them, guess what that means? They've got 700 of you individual inventors that they cannot afford to work with one-on-one, -on -one, if that makes sense. So, so instantly Ava was allowed into baby, you know, bye-bye baby and was an easy transaction for them. They had loved her for years, but they weren't willing to do the work with a solo company and a single, um, a single SKU. That makes so much sense. And then it does. When you get on that side of it, you go, wow, okay, now I see why, you know, that was an issue. And then getting to that point, is that just one example of how making a deal with a shark can take you to the next level? Can you give me um, some more insight into what Barbara and working with her and her team was able to do to get you to that point? I'm sure that's just one of mm -hmm. many things. Yeah, she just, um, I think I just learned so much from her as a person and a business owner and, and someone who is very like-minded with, with us struggling with schooling and being more creative and so I just really learned from her on a personal level. And I also learned from her, you know, my dad was an entrepreneur. I learned a lot growing up watching him during my life, but she was so frugal and so smart with money. Like when we first started with Ava, I went to her and I said, what is the, uh, what is the, pe what are the people we use to record the sound on Ava? Aren't they voiceovers? And, and I said, I need to hire one of those, don't I, to do the sound? Cause I didn't know anything about this. And she said, what are you crazy? You're going to go record that. You recorded it for Shark Tank on your little sound boxes that you brought from home you can record it now. And so she had me find a radio friend here in Atlanta, go into his studio, borrow it for 20 minutes and, re and plug my nose and record the sound that was on the original <laughs> Ava the Elephant for seven years. And, but that's the perfect, it cost me nothing. I used a friend, a favor from a friend. He gave me the file. I sent it to my factory and that was that. And for seven years, I had to listen to myself on this product every time I pressed it or every time a child pressed it around me. But that was okay because it was a sweet memory and it, it's a great example of how people like Barbara got to be so successful. They are not throwing money at everything. They are very frugal and smart with, with every penny. I love that. And then do you still work closely with Barbara now? I don't because, I mean, I work, I'm close to her as a friend, but business wise, when we licensed the product, that was the end of her investment. So we made that choice to for her not to invest financially into the, the product because we were going to license it off. And then we would split that up as the licensing came in. So, so yeah, that was kind of the end of the investment phase right around seven or eight years, but it was spectacular while it lasted. That's amazing. And then you're licensing. So you have more time. And in that time you got the idea for mom genius. So tell me what mom genius is. Yeah. So I first did uh, my podcast, which is product genius. And that was just on a whim. It, it was me trying, I got all of these shark tank fans coming at me from all directions saying, can you help me? I have an idea. I don't know where to go. And someone suggested I do a podcast and kind of share stories from what I'd done. And so I started doing it reluctantly. Barbara was actually my first guest. And, um, I don't like the sound of my voice. I don't think I'm, I can stay on track. So I have a great co-host that keeps me on track. But um, that was kind of a give back that led to Mom Genius because as I did more of that, I heard more and more stories and met more and more people. And I knew that they needed more than what I was providing with the podcast. Yes, I was sharing stories and experience, but 
a lot of them didn't know, you know, where to, uh, you know, actually how to actually make these um, connections with the, the people they needed. So whether it be liability insurance or whatever it is in their journey. And so I met my business partner actually through the co-founder of Spanx. Um, Spanx had a co-founder of sorts, the, the boyfriend of Sarah Blakely back in the day um, when they started Spanx, he, they ran it together and then they split up later and they're still great friends or whatever. But I met him in Atlanta. He and I hit it off. We talked about doing a reality show together. We talked about all sorts of things. And he said, you've got to meet these guys that I know. And, and he introduced me to my business partner, Mom Genius. And he was just the most incredible man. And we decided, you know, why don't we do this company where not only do we create our own products, but we, um, we help inventors and we, you know, with the right product we license. And so uh, that's what we've done. We're about to launch a product now that we license the initial idea from an inventor. And uh, we have our own products that are in development. That's amazing. So how many pro do you have a lot of products in development? Like you're like a shark now. So now you're yeah, investing. We only technically have three right now in development, but that's a lot. I mean, <laughs> if you know what goes into the process, it's a lot of funding. It's, a, you know, it's a hundred, hundreds of thousands of dollars that go into even three products. So, uh, two of them are medical products that actually came through other inventors. And so, um, one of them, you know, he brought to me, you know, can you help with this? We showed interest in it. we started working out the details. And if it's, if it's the right entrepreneur and the right product, then it might be a fit for us to do something like that. But we have to look at each one individually, you know, and say, you know, is this a good fit? So you're like a shark. It pretty much, but a nice one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't that crazy to be on that side of it? I never really think of it that way. I think I, I think of it more like, you know, where I was when I started out and these people come to me with the same, um, naive spirit of, oh gosh, you know, I know this can be good, but I have no clue what to do. And cause that's how I was right before Shark Tank. Oh, I would have no clue. And it's with products. I mean, I have a couple of businesses. One is a software product. So it's a little different. The other is service-based. If I was going to make a physical product, I would have no freaking clue. And right. it's a little scary because you are forced to invest money before you make any money. Cause you got to create the thing. Yeah. And, well, and the worst part is this, this industry is covered up in people taking advantage of inventors. It drives me insane. It's the reason I started Mom Genius. We wanted to be the good guys in this space. You see all of these invention help, submit your idea, send me. I just, so I just did a show yesterday, an interview just like this. And on it, we discussed a lady who just got taken for $15,000 what did she get back? A drawing, not a CAD drawing, which is like your actual bones of your product in a, you know, in a system, which you know, but just a 3D drawing. That's what she got for $15,000. And it happens every single day, all the time, especially with Shark Tank making, inventing such a cool thing and such a, you know, a big thing. And so our, our goal is to, you know, help them and not let them fall into these traps of where they get taken advantage of. That makes so much sense. Um, I can only imagine because today anybody can put anything on the internet and people believe yeah. it. Oh, yeah. And sadly, they, they, I don't understand how, but they oftentimes overlook so many things that they shouldn't like. For example, when they reach out to me and they've shared these horror stories, I've asked, you know, what kind of contract did you have in place? What did it say you were supposed to receive? That is, if I had to give a tip to anyone for inventing or if you're going to work with one of these companies, know what you're supposed to be receiving. So if you are, you know, paying somebody $5,000, what are you getting for the $5,000? That should not be vague. You don't go to a car dealership and go, well, I guess I'm getting a car, you know, for this 15 grand. You know exactly what you're walking away with, and you should know that with these companies. And so, and I'm sure a lot of them talk a good game of, you know, maybe throwing a bunch of big terms out there or something to confuse people. But it's shocking to me that anybody would give up that type of money and not have anything to show for it on the other end. So, what do you do at Mom Genius? Tell me a little bit more about Mom Genius. And we're going to link to this also in the show notes so people can sure. visit themselves. So, I personally spend a lot of time on product development now. Uh, doing first prototypes myself and then seeing, you know, working with factories to see how, how we can make the product um, come along and come to life. And so our team does that. And then we spend a lot of time reviewing products because we receive so many um, submissions from different people. We did a invention submission thing when we first launched last year, and that was huge. That's where the product that we're launching right now in a few weeks, uh, that's where that product came from. It came, it was submitted as part of that contest. So it was essentially our winner. Um, 
and that's what we do. And that, that in itself takes so much time and energy because you're, you're, especially with multiple products by next year, we'll probably have 15 products versus three. So, um, yep, that's what we do every day is, is look at different products and actually develop them and bring them to life in the manufacturer. And then, and then all of the stuff that comes after, which is the distribution of the product, which is the bulk of it and the hardest part of it. I think a lot of people think that, you know, I'll invent a product. Next thing I know, it'll be on, you know, all over the world. And it's the distribution that really matters. And are you getting it off the shelf once you get it into a retailer or whatnot? And what do people do if they have an idea um, and they want to reach out to you, they want, they want your help, where should they go? I would recommend them starting. If they have a brand new idea, I put together this little simple course on my personal website on tiffanycrumans.com. And what I did in this course is it's not like a course. I hate to even call it a course, but I basically walked through my whole journey of Ava. And I thought, you know, what did I stumble on? What did I have success with? What did I learn through this whole journey of seven years, seven to 10 years? And um, I put it into this course where I just wrote it like I'm talking to you right now. I wrote it in very plain English. I shared some videos of funny stories, mistakes Barbara and I made. And I encourage people to go on and take that because I want them to basically, I'm trying to get them to do that almost like a, a consultation. So if you go through this course and you go, oh God, I had no idea this is what went into launching a product, then you can be prepared for what's coming next versus a lot of people try to contact us and consult for, you know, they pay me $300 an hour to consult, but they won't get anything out of me in that hour that will be beneficial. Do you know what I mean? I, or they, they get something, but they would never get the full big picture. And so what I tried to do in that course, and I think it's, I have it on there for like 69 bucks right now or something, um, is allow them to look at the whole big picture of what they're going into, you know, like not just prototyping, but what does it look like when you sell to a retailer? What does it look like when you work with a factory? so that they can see the big picture and decide, I'm, should I really move forward with this? I love so that. So I would encourage them to start there. Then we, then Mom Genius is almost like a second step, mainly because I want them to know what they're getting into before they talk to us at Mom Genius. Oh, I get it. And you want people yeah. to be invested. Like I wish- That's exactly right. I wish I had a dollar for everybody who reached out to me. And yep. then once I told them what they actually had to do, they were like, oh, I don't yeah. want to do all this. Yeah. So that's, that's a great, that's, that is the perfect point and exactly why I'm working with one of the medical products that I'm working with right now. He came to me and the work was done. He had already uh, filed his patent. He had already done so much of the bulk of it and presented to me any, any um, competitive, uh, competitive products and had just done so much work and was ready to go. And I was able to take it from there and move it forward versus someone coming and saying, it's just an idea. And you tell them, do some research. And like you said, they're not willing to do it. That, that to me is unacceptable. And I don't even respond to that anymore either, because it's, it's, it's rude, you know, to approach someone that's been down a path that you want to go down and not be willing to do the same work they've done, then I don't have time to, to help with that, to be honest with you. And it is shockingly common. Very common. Yep. It's like so disappointingly common. It's ridiculous. You know what though? It used to upset me. It used to disappoint me. And now I look at it as that's fine. Those are the people that aren't going to make it, that aren't going to do what I've done with this product. And then I really appreciate the ones that did. You know what I mean? I've got, I had a lady who did it um, with a product named Hand, Handy Burpums. And so she came up with a new burp rag basically for babies. And she's a widowed mom, um, works her butt off to support her kids after she lost her husband. And she went in, she did that course, she did the work. And I've become so close to her now. And I'm constantly doing things and opening doors for her and like introducing her to factories and whatnot or bigger companies. I'm trying to help her license right now, actually. And none of that was part of it. You know, like, she's not paying me for that, but she did the work and she is committed and, and I'm more than happy to help her because I've seen that in her. So it makes those even more sweet, right? When, when, uh, the others are a bit lazy. Nope. I get it. I'm going to link to that in the show notes for people listening. They sure. can um, easily get there. Okay. Lastly, I want to finish up because I'm sure this is like the number one question you get is how do you get on Shark Tank and then what do you do to get a deal? And you yeah. actually recently, you chatted with um, Mindy who is in yes. casting at Shark Tank and she kind of walked everybody through the whole thing. So I'm going to link mm -hmm. to that interview with Mindy. Oh, perfect. Um, so she can talk about the actual like Shark Tank production 
side mm-hmm. of things. But for you, because what really ended up making the deal for you was you in the tank speaking. So mm-hmm. what is your advice if people have that opportunity, whether or not it's on Shark Tank, but they're speaking to an, a, a potential investor, maybe even a potential partner, customer, whatever. What is your advice on how to speak to them about your product? Yeah. I think you need to know your story. I don't think I knew that I was going to be kind of casted as this, you know, quote unquote, sweetheart with a heartfelt product. I didn't know that at the time I was going in being authentically me, knowing what I know now and seeing all the seasons and knowing how television works, people are definitely casted in a certain way. So if you're going in, you have to think of it that way. And so like a friend of mine right now is auditioning and I have been talking to him about how I would approach his pitch. And first of all, almost all, or not always, 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 it has to be high energy. So you have to seem like you've, you've drank six cups of coffee and you have to get their attention because these poor casting directors have seen, literally they get 40,000 submissions a year. And so Mindy herself has seen, you know, half of those. And so you start to watch them and they all just run together, right? If somebody's nervous and quiet, you, you've forgotten about them by the time they're done with their pitch, right? So I would, I always recommend that they go in full of energy and then know what you might be casted at. So if you're, if you're this really, you know, harsh, um, hardcore, you know, person when you're in your pitch, that's fine. Be that and be that like 110% and know that you'll probably be casted that way. And you may even get some flack for it, but if you're okay with that, go with it all the way. Or if like my friend that is auditioning, um, he is a father of five girls. He has five girls, which is just insane to think about. And then he lost his job of 20 years in, uh, at, a, at a major um, ra- a radio station, basically, and lost a, a, his job of 20 years and had to kind of be thrown into entrepreneurship and go, what can I do? And so he's decided to do this product that is from his past. And I'm like, that is your story. You know, that's the kind of stuff that when you're thinking about Shark Tank, think about the story that people would remember. And it almost always comes back to the person and their story. That's great advice because first and foremost, it is TV. It is entertainment. That's right. That's right. And that's what people forget. And his is not an exciting product. His is not an invention. It is an everyday uh, grocer, grocery store item. And It's never going to be like, oh, my God, one of the top 10 hits of Shark Tank. It's not about that. His story is what people will remember, and that's almost always the case. Cupboard cupboard Pro, that was the perfect example. The best, probably the best pitch ever on Shark Tank were the children who came in and carried on their dad's legacy of a cutting board that sorts that you can sort your food into. And their dad started it and he passed away and their mom had already passed away a few years before that. So they were, they were orphan children essentially and took on their dad's invention and brought it on Shark Tank. And it was like, that's what people remembered. It wasn't about the board. It was about them and their heart. And if you did not cry watching that oh segment, you are you don't have heartless. Heart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that That's was, true. and you're right. That is probably the most memorable because of their story. Yep. I think I bought that just that because that of their, their story. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's the thing. And they didn't make that up or fake it. It was like when I was talking to him the other day, you don't have to come up with fake numbers or big numbers or, you know, make it seem like something that's not just be you and be honest. Cause they, the first and foremost, the casting directors see through the crap, you know what I mean? They see through when someone's making something up and they might just cast you as that person, you know, they might bring you on, but, but be prepared that you might get shredded. Right. I think we've seen a couple of those too. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because again, they're entertaining. (laughs) Yes, that's right. (laughs) All right, Tiffany, this has been amazing. Is there anything else you want to add that I should have asked? No, I don't think so. That was a great interview. It was a lot of fun and I hope it it benefits somebody. Oh, oh my gosh, it totally will. Anybody who's even thinking about making a product, uh, you're going to head to uh, tiffanycrumans.com and you're going to check out her online course before contacting her about Mom Genius because she doesn't want to waste her time with the tire you know kickers. What? Let's do a code for that to make it even less. Okay. Um, I don't know what it, what it's at right now, to be honest with you. I said it when we started social distancing. I, I changed the price to make it lower just so people could do it and study while they were at home. Um, so we'll make it less and we'll put it in as part of this post and, and do some sort of code so they can get it for cheaper. Perfect. What, what do you want the code to be? Hmm. Mm, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> What's easiest? We could make I, it. Why don't we make it uh, media? That'll work. Does that work? Media? Does it have to media. be all caps? Um, yes. I'll okay. put it all caps media. 
All caps media. That will be in the show notes. Um, Awesome. Tiffany, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much for listening. Remember, you can get all of that information um, about the uh, online course and training program. Use that coupon code MEDIA at tiffanycrumans.com. I'm linking to the Product Genius Podcast to Mom Genius. But remember, she doesn't want to see you in Mom Genius until you go through that online training and she's given you that coupon code of media to help you out with it. And then I'm also linking to that interview that she did with the Shark Tank casting producer to answer all of those questions that you probably have. Thanks for listening and I'll see you again on the next episode of Become a Media Maven.